Hey everybody, thank you for joining me back for another video. I want to talk today a little bit about the parallels between Jerusalem that was and the new Jerusalem that now is, and some of the mistakes that people make when approaching this subject. And, and I'll start with the mistake. I think one of the major mistakes when talking about the typology in Scripture is, is forgetting that the physical that God has given us ultimately points to the spiritual. There are spiritual realities that correspond to the physical realities. We are physical beings and the physical is good. This is not a Gnostic idea that I'm pushing where the physical is, is only ha is, is bad or anything like that. But what I'm saying is that physical things like the temple, like the sacrificial system, like the priesthood, all of these things are but shadows of spiritual heavenly realities that we are experiencing now in Christ, but will experience the fullness of in the new creation at the return of Christ. And so I want to read a chapter that I think is very helpful in just kind of pointing this out and then just drawing some parallels from this. So Hebrews chapter 9, it reads, Then indeed, even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service and the earthly sanctuary, for a tabernacle was prepared. The first part, in which was the lampstand, the table, and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And behind the second veil, a part of the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid on all sides with gold, in which were golden the golden pot that had the manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablets of the covenant, and above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot now speak in detail. Now when these things had been thus prepared, the priests always went into the first part of the tabernacle performing the services. But into the second part the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood which he offered for himself and for the people's sins committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit indicated this, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. It was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in, right, in regard to the conscience, concerned only with the foods and drinks, various washings, and fleshly ordinances imposed until the time of Reformation. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come, with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation. Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place, once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant." by means of his death, for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of the inter eternal inheritance. Now what is very, very interesting about this chapter is that it starts by really laying the foundation of the old covenant system. You have the tabernacle, you have the, they describes the, the, the main courtroom, then it goes to the holy of holies. And then it, it, it details the, the things that were contained in the most holy place. It details how the priests could not enter, only the high priest could enter. But then the author of Hebrews goes on to show the limitations of these things. That these things were only concerned with symbolizing the fleshly ordinances that pointed ahead to ultimately, verse 11, the tabernacle not made with hands that is not of this creation. And so we see that there's an earthly Jerusalem with an earthly correspondence, with an earthly purpose that points ahead to this beautiful and fullness of time reality in which Christ, as all in all, brings forth and ushers in the new Jerusalem. Another place that you see this is in Paul, in Paul's letter to 
the Galatians. Flip over there really quick. But in this letter, Paul details the difference between the two covenants. Listen to what he says. For there are two covenants, one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice, O barren, you do, who do not bear. Break forth and shout, you who are not in labor. For the desolate has many more children than she who has a husband. He goes on to say, Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, we are children of promise. But as he who was born according to the flesh then persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what does Scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free so notice again here, here's a contrast. There's this earthly element, this earthly Jerusalem. And Paul says, this earthly Jerusalem has fallen into corruption, into sin, into death, into bondage. But the Jerusalem above, the new Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem, ushered in through the Messiah, she is free and she is the mother of us all. Now let's take a look in Revelation Revelation, there is a woman. There are two women. One is a harlot and one is a bride. Listen to how both women are introduced. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemy. So this woman is the harlot. Now we get over to chapter 21 of Revelation, and listen to this. Then one of the seven angels, who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues, came to me and said, Come, I will show you the bride, of the, lam bride the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. So we have this, again, this contrast between two women introduced the same way. One of the angels with the seven bowls from the seven plagues, comes to John and says, Come, I will show you the harlot, and come, I will show you the bride. And then John is carried away in the spirit in both scenarios, one into the wilderness where he sees a harlot, and one up to a high mountain where he sees the holy Jerusalem. It seems that scripture is very clear and is trying to get a point across. The Jerusalem on earth had a purpose in demonstrating and pointing ahead to fulfillment in Christ. And when Jerusalem did not receive her Messiah, when the high priests and the Pharisees did not receive Messiah Jesus Christ, they became a harlot. They committed a, a, a adultery with the pagan nation of Rome. They conspired against the Christians. They conspired against the people of God, turning themselves into the pagan persecutors of the people of God earlier. The woman is said to be the great city. It's what we read early in Revelation chapter 17, that the woman, the harlot, is called the great city. Now listen, it's very interesting. In chapter 11 of Revelation, the dead bodies of the two witnesses are said to be lying in the great city. Listen, it's spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord 
was crucified. Now, there's only one city where our Lord was crucified, and that is Jerusalem. Spiritually called Sodom, Egypt, and Revelation 17, Babylon, the harlot. Now, why are these names of these pagan cities like Sodom and Egypt and Babylon being applied to Jerusalem? Well, think about it. Sodom, Egypt, Babylon, what do they all have in common? They all have in common that they were pagan and that they persecuted the people of God. They were pagan and they persecuted the people of God. And when we read the book of Acts, the biggest persecutor of the church is Jerusalem, is the Jewish people. So they have become the very pagan nations that at one time were against them. And John is very clear in the book of Revelation to contrast this harlot with the new Jerusalem. The old Jerusalem had become a harlot. And the new Jerusalem, as Paul says, is, is free. The, the Jerusalem that corresponds to Hagar is, is, a, is a servant, is a slave, is in bondage. But the Jerusalem above is free. And the beautiful thing about this is in history, as many of you know, I've talked about it in the past, Jerusalem came collapsing to the ground in 70 AD. The pagan nation had fallen under the judgment of God for her persecution of God's people. And what makes this even more amazing is when you go back and read Hebrews 9 where it details this earthly sanctuary, this earthly tabernacle, this earthly holy of holies, followed by Christ as the high priest, who has a perfect tabernacle, not of this creation, not with blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood. Christ, who through his eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, he cleanses us from dead works so that we might serve the living God. And he is the mediator now of this new covenant. And that those who are called receive the promise of the inter eternal inheritance. Brothers and sisters, the, the idea that is sometimes perpetuated in modern evangelicalism that one day earthly Jerusalem is going to be resurrected. Christ is going to come down from heaven. He's going to reign on a throne from earthly Jerusalem. It's a misplaced hope. It's a misplaced understanding we need to recognize that scripture is so plain that, that, that those types, those shadows, they served a purpose. And that purpose was to point ahead. And when the fulfillment came, when Christ, the fullness of all those things, arrived on the scene, those things had to be put away. And due to the judgment, uh, due to the persecution and rejection of Christ that was demonstrated by the people of Israel, they became the objects of God's wrath and judgment as the old covenant was put away in a consummate way in 70 AD and ushered in to the new Holy of Holies, the heavenly Jerusalem. And that, brothers and sisters, is why we are to pray for the kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. Because these heavenly realities that have been purchased by Christ will manifest themselves in the renewal of all things, the renewal of creation, the renewal of the cosmos. And this is what we look forward to. This is what we, we hearken and hasten with our, with our prayers, with our, with our dedication to serving the church, to preaching the gospel, proclaiming him to all nations. These are the things, this is the expectation. The expectation should never be that the world is going to descend into darkness and go back to Christ reigning in earthly Jerusalem. No, the world is waking up to the glory and goodness of Jesus Christ and the finish of all this is when the manifestations that all these earthly things pointed to come in their consummation with the return of Jesus Christ. So brothers and sisters, I just, I get so pumped up about this stuff. It's amazing to read the Old Testament and to recognize all of these things point ahead to Jesus Christ. And we, by faith in the Messiah, now share in these realities with the expectation that they will arrive in their fullness. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. And so we have this assurance of the hope that Christ is going to restore all things, that the Holy of Holies will cover the earth, that we as the people of God are being built up 
as the temple of God across the earth. And we hope for, we have conviction in these things. We have conviction. And this is what our faith clings to, is the promises that in Christ Jesus, we belong to these realities. And we will see these realities on the last day. So I pray that that's encouraging to you. Um, I, I'm encouraged just reading about it and learning more in Scripture. And reading and recognizing typology throughout the Bible is a very important skill to, to possess as an exegete. So I pray this was helpful, and I look forward to talking to you all in the next video.